Hello, San Francisco! <laughs> For far too long, us nerds have lived in the shadows, the basements, the <laughs> tiny rented... Anyways, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Avi. I am uh, the founder of Silver Sprocket. We're a local radical indie comic publisher and retail store and gallery. Uh, we help put on this event. We are so thrilled for you all to be here. Uh, we just had, we just hit over a thousand attendees. Like, holy fucking shit, that's incredible. Uh, so we've got such an amazing, thriving, queer comic community here in San Francisco, and we're so excited to welcome all these creators, all of you. Uh, I'm, I expect many of you are creators yourselves. And, um, and the purpose of this panel here is really to showcase what uh, local queer publishing, um, just the variety, uh, of different operations, uh, how they operate. Uh, we're really hoping to demystify what publishing even is, uh, hopefully inspire some of you to publish your own work or start your own presses, and also just spotlight some uh, really incredible uh, local publishing houses that are all doing very just impressive, fantastic, vital comics uh, with a wide variety of different approaches, uh, styles, uh, ways of doing business, types of books being created. Um, just really amazing work over here that is right here in your backyard, part of your community. So um, let me um, kick things off. I'm just gonna introduce our panelists. Um, so uh, to my left is Casper of ABO Comics. Um, then uh, we've got Brina of Linnea House. Uh, then we've got Tara of, st of uh, st Stacked Deck Press. And then uh, we've got Yasmin uh, of Dry over at the end. So thank you all. So I guess just to uh, kick things off, I think just um, how about uh, we all uh, just, if you all want to introduce yourselves, um, I guess we'll, I'll start with Casper and we'll go this way. And um, yeah, if you could just tell us a little bit about your publishing operation. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Casper. I'm the co-founder and director of ABO Comics, short for Abolition Comics. Uh, we have a storefront and art gallery in Oakland, so if you ever make it across the bridge, I know it's a massive trek, but please come visit us. We're over on Telegraph Avenue. Um, we are occupying not a basement dwelling, but actually a three-story former haunted cinema, so it's super gothy, super fun. Um, so our publication... Um, or our publishing house works exclusively with currently incarcerated queer and trans artists. Uh, we work with people in prisons and jails nationwide, help people sort of establish a creative practice while they're incarcerated and help them through the publishing process. So whether they want to publish their individual solo comics, if they want to, um, we've branched out into publishing people's like autobiographies and memoirs, poetry, all sorts of different uh, aspects into the publishing world, sort of trying to um, like Avi said, demystify the publishing world, which has historically kind of been kept from people in prison um, as far as, uh, you know, getting their stories out there in their own words. So that's what we do. And we also uh, help people sell their creative work. So while they're inside, if they're painting, drawing, if they're doing leather working or craft work, uh, we have that available at our gallery as well for sale. And then we donate all of our proceeds back to the commissary accounts or to the loved ones of the artists that we work with so that they can remain financially uh, stable during their incarceration. Thank you. Hi. Oh, do y'all want to clap for that amazing intro? <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, my name is Brina Nunez. I'm the co-founder of La Neja House. Uh, my spouse is Lawrence Lindell, who's also the co-founder. Um, you might be seeing them pushing like a little adorable baby in like a green like checkered outfit. So that's my partner. Um, yeah, we started the press um, during like the beginning of the pandemic, which I I think I, when I, I kind of laugh at it because it doesn't seem like a really smart idea. But at the same time, I feel like we were all like living in the internet <laughs> for the most part. So it was really nice to just find the time and also just the the space for us to create comics. We both have been published um, individually in other ways um, and experiencing different processes of being published in, I don't wanna say 
speaking for myself, mostly been working with um, clients like the Nib, for instance, and Lawrence has been published by Drawn and Quarterly. And at the same time, we just sort of miss like the the approach to making like our own comics that aren't necessarily being assigned um, via commission. And we just want to keep the zine spirit alive. And that's how we both found each other as partners and as a family run press. That's why we wanted to create this space to honor our pace and like the sense of time as well, because I feel like we're um, also kind of define the expectations in a very capitalist society that we live in. Sometimes we feel, at least for myself, I feel rushed to complete work and um, Lawrence has a very different pace at the same time. So we also just wanted to create Laneja House as just like our own little sacred space for us to really be um, tender with the process and with the work and to really make this our own personal playground as well. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about <laughs> Linnea House. I'm Tara Madison Avery. My publishing imprint is Stacked Deck Press. Um, we launched in 2015. Um, our, we st well, started with um, a book called Cologranin, which is our all ages trans series, but our, the project we were formed to to publish was a, a work from an association with Prism Comics called Alphabet. Some of you might remember that. So I also am a board member of Prism Comics. So if you are a, a convention goer and you go to conventions here in California, you might see Stack Deck Press and Prism Comics joined at the hip. And a lot of that's because we do a lot of things together. Um, I uh, am not local in the sense I am, I'm the, live in the Palm Springs area, but I do uh, publish a lot of local creators. Um, some names you might be familiar with, Awan Mance, Tyler Cohen, John Macy, and many others. And um, love coming here a few times a year to see what y'all are up to. And um, in the ensuing nine years, um, we've published some, uh, published some pretty, uh, some things we're pretty proud of. One is the first all trans comics anthology. We're still here, which we were fortunate enough to win an Ignatz Award for. And um, we're also here this weekend to promote a couple of brand new titles. One is, I'm going to get my plug all out of the way, and then we can, then, we, then we'll, the, the suspense will be over. We Belong, which is an all black, all queer sci fi fantasy comics anthology, which is debuting today. This is the first time it's been available anywhere. And then we also have a graphic memoir coming up uh, called A Good Sport, which is about one woman's participation in the 2018 gay games. Um, and so uh, just been uh, plugging away at this for nine years. Um, something Keith Knight once said is, you know, we're too small to fail, you know. Mm -hmm. So if it's an operation of one person, if you've got to um, uh, put things on the back burner for a while and go get a desk job somewhere else to, to, to make sure the mortgage is paid, well, you, your, your, your business doesn't disappear. It just comes back to you when you have the time, energy, and, and financial good fortune to return to it. So, uh, and that's been my story for nine years now and um, hopefully for many more. Hello. My name is Yasmin. Um, I'm part of Dry, which is Daniel Zo, Raul Higuera, Yasmina Berifar, Dry. Very original. Um, we're actually Avi's child, so we all started a job at Silver Sprocket together and met each other, and we're like, wow, there are people who are making comics in the Bay. So um, we put our forces together. Realistically, what happened is that I wanted to apply to SF Scene Fest, and I didn't want to do it alone, so I said, hey, you two come. So that started the whole thing. Um, they, they still work there. I don't, but you know, it's kind of the breeding ground of dry. Um, I think I am from the Bay Area and so is Daniel. So I think uh, one of the focus of the kind of work we do is like seeing the people that are making comics in the Bay Area, which is an abundant amount. I think often the Bay Area isn't really included in the conversation. And I think um, we're currently working on an anthology. We have like 16 artists that are all from the Bay Area as kind of like the starting, kind of dipping our feet into putting other people's work out there. So I think ultimately it's just highlighting Bay Area artists um, and also focusing on mostly publishing women and women of, uh, women of color or people of color because I think a lot of anthologies have 10 white guys and 
it's not revolutionary. So um, yeah, that's kind of the who we are. Cool, thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. Um, so I guess I wanna know, I'd, I'd love to talk some more about what are, what are your goals with your publishing house and what's unique about your approach to publishing that really serves what those goals are? Um, I guess I'll start with you, Yasmin, we'll work back this way. Yeah, I think ultimately, um, often comics feels like a community in which people are like, I wish I could do that, right? Like, for me, I feel like it's something that's really accessible in some ways, and it's not accessible. So um, I think a lot of the mystification is, how do I do this? How do I print this? How do I format this? And I think often there were times that I wanted this little magical place that'd be like, I will tell you everything, and we'll do it all together, right? Um, so I think I want to kind of like create that space for the Bay Area that there are people that we feel like should, you know, we want to put them out there. So um, I think putting their work in a place that it hasn't been in because we're able to table at these events. Um, often people maybe only have one comic they've ever made or they'd ever made one. So it's kind of intimidating to table. So I think the fact that we're able to kind of be together and have like friendship be the center of what we do kind of bringing that towards like multiple groups of people and publishing their work for the first time or having their work in print. Um, and again, as I said earlier, I think it's just sort of giving a space for people who don't, generally don't have that space. And uh, it comes kind of naturally to like feature those people because that's the people that are our friends. So I think it's friendship. Yeah, and as a follow-up, correct me if I'm wrong, but has Dry so far just published the three of you? So it's the three of you helping each other get each other's work out. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think, again, like I was, I was too nervous to do it myself. So having them as like two people with me kind of stayed, because I think it really does help to have multiple people in your court, so. Yeah, so what I think is really badass over here is rather than being like a formal publisher with like an editor and a like someone assigning things, you're just three friends who came together to hold each other's hands and support each other as a group of three friends getting your work out there. And anyone here can do that. Yeah, you can do it, just, <laughs> just ask. There's so many friends that would just want to like sit with you. You can just goof around for five hours and make money. Just staple <laughs> stuff. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, my uh, what makes my publishing company unique is that I am the sole employee, which means that I'm the person Mitt Romney warned you about. I am a corporation. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I think a lot of, for me, is I kind of backed into this whole thing. Um, when Prism needed to publish for Alphabet nine years ago, the publisher who had committed to publishing it, you know, was unable to, con unable to fulfill their commitment for perfectly understandable reasons. There was no controversy, but just said, I'm sorry, I can't take on this project. And I was at the time working at the family business, and um, uh, we had a, a shell corporation lying around that we weren't doing anything with. Once upon a time, it had been of some use to us, and I said, uh, I told the president of PRISM that, okay, well, um, I have a corporation, I'll turn it into a publisher, I'll publish a book. And that's how I got started. So um, now 21 titles nine years later, um, and uh, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're doing it. I, I don't know how this is unique, but I like, I try to, two things I like to keep in mind is to, is to find, you know, new people, new talent, and, and give them a platform where they can, you know, get their work in front of in front of eyes who can you know do good things for them. You know, to to get them in in, in high profile projects or pro projects of of critical import or or something that people can actually say, oh my gosh, this person is amazing, and we're going to give that person an opportunity to publish. Or if I'm really lucky and they liked liked how I handled the whole mess, then then maybe they'll stick with me, and I can I can uh, continue to uh, to to work with them, so, um, but for the most part, um, yeah, I, I, am a, I am an army of, of, of one, uh, if you don't count the cats, and, <laughs> and that's, the, I guess that, may be, that might, be, might make me unique, so. I count the cats. Very good. Yes, yes, always count the cats. Um, I think we also operate, or the way we also started La Neja House 
was like in a very similar direction or um, approach to, to dry um, because we've always been in conversation, Lawrence and I, and also Trinidad Escobar when we all used to live together in a place, a special place in Oakland called Cartoonist House. And um, yeah, and I think it, I'm gonna be really cheesy and rom com I guess, because we that's how I fell in love with Lawrence too, through places like San Francisco Zine Fest and our just, our love for the, the medium and for um, the ways that we feel seen in comics and how they've been just these really special places of um, harboring community, a sense of home and agency and just, um, inspiring, inspiring us to be better cartoonists and educators as well. But um, yeah, I think what I'm gonna probably be echoing what I said earlier is that we wanted to create this space for ourselves. Um, it's a lot of work to maybe publish other people's work, so it's just nice for us to have that for us and just to call it a family-run business. And the name of the press itself was inspired by um, us combining our mother's like maiden names together when we were getting married <laughs> during the pandemic. So we couldn't, we realized when we were getting married, we couldn't automatically change our last names to the, this new name. So we were like, oh, whoops. <laughs> we really didn't do our homework um, during the ceremony, but at least um, that's gonna live on in the press. And um, I guess the goals are always being met with every issue that we've been able to pump out. Um, but Lawrence uh, honestly does a lot of the heavy lifting because I'm always creatively like burnt out. And I think that's why it's also been amazing to be in partnership with Lawrence because they have the, the energy and the drive to um, use themselves as like a resource to do the, the book layouts, um, producing ideas, and also being my cheerleader because I tend to be really defeatist when it comes to um, myself and measuring how productive I am in like, um, again, a capitalist society. We live in this culture of immediacy where we feel like we need to be seen all the time as artists or cartoonists. And Lawrence will go into the archives of like all of these like, um, cart or these comics that I just have like lying in the bottom of like the barrel and they'll be like, let's let's put this in the next issue. And I'm like, really? Like, I don't know, it doesn't seem that good, but they'll be like, no, no, like it needs to, <laughs> it needs to live out there in the world. And I think, again, it just comes down to the ways we've been able to um, really embrace or feel embraced by the zine community and just the spirit of doing things on your own time, um, owning your autonomy, and like what you were saying earlier, Avi, like doing things without, you know, needing to be in collaboration with the editor. And sometimes, I mean, not to dislike any editors in the audience or the people that we've worked with <laughs> in the past, but it's just nice to really create something that's really raw and authentically ourselves without having to do a lot of self-editing. And I think that's what's beautiful about the work that we do too, because um, it just comes straight from the heart and it really just shows who we are as like individuals, as, um, as a team. And when I think back to all of the issues that we've put out together, it's also kind of like our homage to um, Los Bros and like the way the Love and Rockets series have been published and we just love the way that there's just like a non-linear like approach to creating like these like mini anthologies. I mean, there are some linear like storylines, but it's always like each issue is like a surprise. Like you don't know what to expect in the next one. So I feel like that's what's been pretty special about working in tandem with my partner. And as a quick little follow-up question, uh, one thing that I uh, was really impressed by from um, from your your just collective oper operations early on was um, the Bailey's website, which was a really uh, fantastic resource. I wonder if you could speak to um, you know what what that was about, like the impetus for creating that, and what kind of success or impact you've seen it have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I'm just gonna be like putting Lawrence on blast because they put in the work to building the website and... Can you describe what it is? Oh, the Baileys, yeah. 
Um, the website itself, it's um, an online archive of um, Bay Area cartoonists um, that are currently with us. And I, I look back to um, the conversations Lawrence and I would have too about like some of the stuff that we're learning in comics classes or like things or like just the perception of like how maybe the cartoonist industry or comics industry might kind of like see the Bay Area under the magnifying glasses, maybe not being as thriving. I, I mean, we have a really rich history here and I feel like we've always spoken about it in the past tense, but I just remember Lawrence being like, no, like there's so many people here doing such amazing work. Like let's, like we got to do this. The Baileys has to happen. And uh, they were spearheading the Kickstarter for the first issue of the Baileys. And again, us being in conversation, like who should we highlight who has, um, hasn't been giving the roses, but who have also inspired us as cartoonists to keep moving forward. And I'm really happy to say that I, we got to feature um, an artist who's inspired me to like be a memoir cartoonist, um, Jaime Crespo. He's like my, my comics uncle and, well, our uncle. And he's the, the artist who was featured on the cover of um, the first issue of the Baileys. And I feel like, yeah, that's a goal that we've been able to meet too and to see cartoonists or getting emails from people saying that it's been a really useful resource, um, especially for folks who are trying to like add more, um, add more names from this, this landmass um, in their curriculums. And it's just really nice to see how, how reciprocal like the, the experience has been because we just do it out of love. And I feel like the way we receive like that gift back is just hearing how useful that website has been for other people. Well, it got me a gig, so thanks, Brina. Yeah, it's a good website. Go on it. Yeah, it's like a, a database, like, a, like I don't want to say database because that implies like massive reams of data, but it's like a, a directory of local uh, queer and cartoonists of color. Um, and it just having a central resource that people can go to because people are like, oh, I don't know any like whatever. And it's like, really? Or, like, you're really not trying, but here, it's so fucking easy. <laughs> so uh, thank you for doing that on behalf of uh, the entire everybody. What's the URL? Thebaileys.com. And I think you can also find it through our press's website, lenehahouse.com. I'll spell that out. Baileys, ah, oh, yeah, B-A-Y-L-I-E-S. Cool, thank you. Uh, Casper, and the, the question again was, uh, what is, uh, like, what are, what are the goals of your publishing house and what's unique about your approach to publishing that really, um, you know, directs it towards that? Uh, I think the goals of our publishing house have really shifted a lot over time. Um, we went into this work really not knowing what we were getting ourselves into in the slightest. Uh, it was back in 2017, um, two of my friends, and this is actually how I met Avi, one of our co-founders of ABO Comics, um, who was really interested in comic making here in the Bay. We were discussing um, sort of some of the advocacy work I was doing with queer prisoners, um, which I had been doing for the better part of a decade at that point. And um, I knew a lot of artists in prison, and so we just had the idea that it'd be cool to reach out to people and see if they would want to do a comic anthology about their experience and their life as uh, a queer person inside. And so we took out a call for submissions ad in, a, in the Black and Pink newspaper, which is an organization that links up queer people in prison with Free World Pen Pals. And um, we just were inundated with hundreds and hundreds of letters from artists all around the nation who were just thrilled at the idea of getting to share their stories in comic form. So um, we put together a comic anthology in 2017 just as like that was our goal, just to do a fun project with some of the artists I knew and some other you know new friends inside. And uh, they wouldn't let us stop. So uh, we did it again in 2018 and again they wouldn't let us stop. <laughs> so here we are now in um, 
whatever year it is now. And um, we've published, I think, over 25 books, another probably 30 or so zines. And our goals are just completely evolving and sh uh, shaped by whatever our friends inside prison want us to do. So <laughs> a lot of the agency has been taken out of our hands and put into their hands by the incredible ideas that artists have and working with hundreds of artists now all over the nation. We grew from working with uh, 25 incarcerated artists in 2017 to now our mailing list is over 600 people. Um, who are submitting art to us all year long. Uh, we get hundreds of letters <laughs> a month and we're drowning under that, but it's, uh, it's, it's like a beautiful drowning. Um, and so through their guidance and their ideas, we've done stuff like a first season of a podcast with interviews with currently incarcerated queer folks. Um, you know, people have ideas for database making or research projects. Um, of course, all of the comics that people want to do. So we've branched out into doing people's individual graphic novels, um, publishing their life stories through their autobiographies. A lot of people are doing illustrated um, uh, poetry books or um, drawing books. Um, a lot of it also doubles as advocacy work as well to be able to share people's stories and what they're going through inside. That's also helped us finance things like gender affirming surgeries for prisoners or eye surgery for people who are going blind inside or uh, medical co-pays for whatever kind of issues people are going through. It's also helped us finance things like um, buying art supplies at commissary or supplementing prison diets which are notoriously terrible. So, you know, being able to buy people like a, a ramen noodle soup at commissary through, um, through comic book sales has been uh, something that we never really expected. Um, but yeah, it's just constantly shifting goals that we never really know what we're doing, but somehow we just kind of find ways to make it work. So. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And that's kind of a follow-up question. I feel like it's um, a lot of people don't even expect that there is like a genre of comics that's comics made by queer prisoners. Um, how has that been? How has the reception to, of that been to the outside world? Because I know um, anybody who's ever tried to publish anything knows how hard it is just to, you know, make something exist, to break even, to make money on it, and you're able to actually get money and resources back to people on the inside. Uh, how how is how is that? It's hard. Um, it's I mean it's it's wonderful. I, I couldn't imagine falling into any better project with my life. But it's it's difficult. A lot of it's um, thankfully we get grant funding now as a nonprofit. Um, but really, our community has just been so wonderful and receptive to the idea and uh, we we do a lot of this work with completely volunteer support. So people who just, you know, really believe in the fact that prisoners are human beings and um, should have agency and care and love in their lives and, um, you know, still be connected to the outside community because so often we find like with people in prison, it's just out of sight, out of mind. Family support drops off after a certain amount of time. Um, people lose friends. They they really have lost all connection to the outside world. So um, the fact that like our community is so invested in making sure that the community inside prison um, stays connected to us and has resources and has opportunities to share their stories in their own words and from their own perspective and um, not just be told, you know, by the media or um, by outside advocates um, ha has been really cool to see. Amazing. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask a one last round of questions. Um, I'm, and then um, I'm going to ask that I'm and ask everyone to hold up their work so you guys can actually actually do you guys want to do that right now and just hold up your your comics so people can see what the hell it is we're even talking about. <laughs> I realize that that should have been part of our introduction, but um, you know we've got a, a wide variety of like you know photocopied stuff, resographed or offset printed, 
um, of, of all different sorts of, of production values and lengths and bindings. Um, a, a lot of stuff handmade like in bedrooms or op sent off to a printer, so just you can do all this stuff, but uh, thank you. Um, okay, so my last last question before we turn this over to the Q and A, um, I'm just curious, like, what have been some um, some like notable challenges that you have faced in running your publishing operation? Um, like, what what's been the most difficult or challenging or you know interesting in that area? And then I'd also like to ask, what have been some successes that you're especially proud of? Like things that like really came together that you're that are just like fuck yeah, like we did it. And uh, we'll start with Casper. Uh, challenges. Um, well, working with the prison system is, is really hard. Um, they don't like us, and they don't like us telling the stories of people they're keeping captive. So we face a lot of censorship issues, um, especially as we've gotten kind of bigger and gotten some name recognition. Um, I, I did some prison visits, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, and I walked into the prison, and I had never been there before, and they looked at my ID and, ID and went, oh, oh, you're Casper. And I was like, how the fuck? Um, but it turns out that there's not a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of publishers working with uh, incarcerated artists. So um, you kind of get that name recognition in prison. And so that means that like every time we release a new publication, it goes through so much scrutiny by the prison system. And our books have been banned and hundreds of prisons nationwide and um, we're you know, fighting tooth and nail First Amendment stuff all the time to make sure that um, we jump through every loophole or jump through every hoop they put us through, kind of um, make sure we adhere to every prison rule and regulation so that our publications are accessible um, by the artists who are making them. And um, we're actually in a lawsuit right now um, against San Mateo County Jail for um, censorship and for uh, basically outlawing all physical mail from coming into their facilities and just making it so prisoners don't have outlets to communicate with friends and family anymore. And that's happening all across the country right now um, as prisons move towards um, phasing out physical mail and moving completely to digital tablet mail, which makes it it's so that every piece of correspondence that goes into prison, every book, every photograph, every child's drawing is stored indefinitely in a government database forever that's accessible by any and all government employees anytime they want for any reason and they don't have to explain it. So um, we're seeing like this sort of authoritarian takeover in the prison system that's getting worse and worse as years go by and making it harder and harder to stay in contact with people inside and just make art and just make comics with our friends. Um, so that's definitely a challenge we're facing, but successes is that <laughs> we're still doing it. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we won't give up, and um, we're still publishing, and, and we, you know, we've accumulated hundreds and hundreds, if not borderline thousands of pieces of artwork and comics and just amazing stories that even if they banned us tomorrow from ever corresponding with people again, we'll still share stories until we're dead. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out ways. Humans are... are um, clever, and then we can always find loopholes in the rules, so, and, uh, you know, we're silly little anarchist kids, so we'll fight the government till the day we die, <laughs> and that's my success story. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you guys do, by the way. Oh, thank you for you. <laughs> all, all that you do as well. <laughs> um, we face a different kind of challenge. Um, our current one is just, um, I guess I might be speaking for myself or maybe for the both of us, just finding enough respite to recharge from being <laughs> full-time parents to a beautiful 18-month-year-old um, child, um, also the third member of Linnea House. And um, yeah. 
finding finding the time to not only just create more more um, issues for Linnea House, but also just like finding time to also see what's available for us in terms of like funding. Um, yeah, because we're both doing full time cartooning and education stuff at the same time, and. <laughs> We chose really lucrative jobs for our family. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll just distinctly say that the way that I guess I would also measure success is that we're still existing, we're still making work, um, despite the fact that we're really, really tired and just like squinty-eyed in the <laughs> all hours of the day and just more crunchy joints at this period in our life. But um I feel like the love of making comics is what's keeping us and keeping Linnea House alive. So I find the 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 fun part, the easy part, well, easy is, is an overstatement. Making the books is is always a fairly straightforward process. You have an anthology, you put out a CFS, you, you, uh, you make an editorial review of the people who want to participate, you decide who's suited to the book and who's not, or someone approaches you with a, with a, with a work of their own and you make that decision. The, the, the real trick is selling the books. You know, you can you can you can create the most amazing piece of work, the most you know, this this document of, of queer culture and and it, and its moment in queer history. And the real trick is getting it into people's hands, and they want them. You know, they're out there. Um, so um, I I have been getting by with um, sort of a patchwork quilt of independent distributors, and uh, and also just. Meeting, meeting, going, whenever I go to a town, you know, if I have an extra day or an extra afternoon in my schedule for, on a convention weekend, I, I go to bookstores, I go to comic shops, I, I bring my card, I, I develop direct wholesale relationships with, 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 with the stores themselves. A lot of them like that because that means they can get the book without having to pay the distributor their cut, you know? And it means I also get the sale without having to pay the distributor their cut. So it's, um, it's, it also gives me, uh, gives me, I get to, to, to see what people want to read. I think that's, uh, you know, what people are reading, what, where the, where the, meet, meet the, you know, hunt where the ducks are, right? Meet the reader where they live. Um, and so I think that's, that is the, the most challenging part is selling the books. Um, however, um, I, you know, I think in terms of, if you were looking for things that came together rather nicely, number one is probably we're still here. It's my perennial seller. And, you know, we, you know, we, we really, you know, Jean Thornton was co-editor on that. And she and I, she covered the East Coast, I covered the West Coast. And we, we were the transcontinental railroad of transness. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we drove the golden spike in and we came up with a winner. Um, but, uh, was there really a golden spike? Did they really do that, or was that just just like a legend? I don't know. Was that real? Okay. And then um, the other like other things is like the the series we do a series of um, coloring books. They're they're they feature all real life individuals, LGBTQ historical coloring book series. And um, somebody approached me, friend John Macy, and um, and his friend Avery Cassell, and they said, well, we want to do a coloring book that revolves that 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 features the famous butch lesbians from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Now, somebody approaches you with this coloring book idea and you've never published a coloring book before, you think, well, you know, that might be an interesting addition to my catalog. That might sell a copy here and there, you know. Somebody's gonna be interested in it. It's my biggest selling coloring book and has been for seven years now, you know. Um, so, you never know, you know. I mean, I've had other hits, but you know, I've, like as as time goes on, the, you know, more months than not, the the coloring book that sells the most most is Butch Lesbians of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And who would think, you know, upper, upon first first blush, that oh yeah, that's what people really want to get their crayons out for, you know? <laughs> so that was that that was that was a really pleasant surprise. So. Um, but you know the you know again, as we have all I think the common theme here is we we all get to keep doing it. We're all too small to fail. Um, I'm just looking forward to doing more and um, maybe branching out into other other areas of publishing. But but uh, comics is 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 my is my thing. It's all I've ever wanted to do, and I'm glad I can keep doing it. Um, I like the idea of starting what's good first. Um, I think one of the things that since we're, 
I imagine it as a little clown car and all three of us are in there trying our best. So I think, uh, I think it's about community. So that's such a vague word. What does that mean? I think it really means, okay, well, Yasmin got a job that is at a college and then she has a risograph at her disposal. Okay, now we can make a risograph anthology. Okay, if we can do a risograph anthology, what, how are we gonna bind it? Okay, well, we would use the saddle stitch from Silver Sprocket. All right, okay, then like how are we, you know, it's like all of these little things of thinking about the network of people that you have. Um, I didn't go into certain spaces and be like, that's the person who has the perfect binder that I need, right? I think it's just we have a community of people around us in various ways that can support us. Um, it's also just finding ways to be resourceful, uh, asking around. I think often there's a fear, right? Like if you see a space where, uh, like Tiny Splendor in Berkeley, I was curious where they get their paper and they're like, go to Kelly Paper in Concord. And I was like, okay and it's just a paper shop, and that's where I get my paper now, you know? So um, I think asking the right questions and just fostering relationships that feel authentic, um, it kind of nourishes you, but it also nourishes the community. So I think having that aspect is the forefront of, basically that's basically how we are able to make the stuff we do was just from the support of our friends, so. Um, I told my students this, like, all of you guys have each other. That's your community. Um, and if, albeit you be in a college or some sort of friend group, you know someone with something and you can all kind of work together. It doesn't have to be this high production value item. It can be something that's Xerox with a staple and then you can keep going. Um, so with that being the little clown car, I think the challenges are is that there's no rules or there's no real, like, we're all figuring out as we go. Um, we're gonna make a 48 page anthology and um, we're trying to figure out how to staple all that together, you know? We'll get to that point when we get there. Um, and I think again, it just is the challenges that come upon the way of making this stuff. Um, I think again, just asking for help uh, and the, uh, figuring it out as you go. I don't think there's really a rule manual, but I'm, an open book, if someone asked me, where'd you do this, how'd you do that? I, I think I'd love to answer those questions at any point. I think it's important, I think, to like kind of gatekeep or keep things like a little troll with, with gold or something, you know? Like, uh, there's only, we're all just cartoonists who are making comics, you know? So I think uh, upholding each other. So I think, yeah, challenge is community and community is, is good, so. Thank you, and I, I do, uh, you are all too kind. And I, and I think I, I speak for everybody at this, uh, on the stage right here and probably in this entire festival that um, none of us wanna be gatekeeping any of the knowledge or resources that we have. So if any of you are curious about like how we did something or where something got printed or how we achieved some special effect, um, how we got distribution to through somewhere, like. Uh, I, I think all of us are open books and are always very happy to share what we know and make that accessible and available to us. Um, I would love for more people to be good at publishing comics so that we don't have to publish as many and I could take a nap. So, but it's also a joy and a gift and we love doing it. So we're not mad, but we, we definitely don't want to be the only people up here on a pedestal on a literal stage, fuck. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, we've got time for a couple questions. So uh, if you've got questions, you wanna raise your hand and... Um, I have a mic, so if you raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. All right. Um, thank you everybody for, for, for your presentations. Um, if you could quickly uh, run down the names of the organizations that are publishing again, please. Um, sure, so uh, if you go to the website for Pride and Panels, we do have a listing of who we all are and what our publishing houses are called, but um, I guess we could just do a, a roll call. Um, I'm Avi from Silver Sprocket. Actually, all of us are tabling in the room um, in the around the corner, so you, after this, I'm sure that we'll all be back at our tables. But um, yeah, Avi at Silver Sprocket. I'm Casper from ABO Comics. Brina from Laneha House. Tara from Stack to Deck Press. Yasmin from Dry Comics. Yeah, hi. Uh, Tara talked a little bit about distribution and about like 
going to stores and stuff. I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit more about like, I know it's been tough in comics distribution, like Diamond kind of melted down and some stuff. How much of your stuff is sold in like traditional comic book stores? How much of it is sold in like more zine-like stores like Silver Sprocket versus like, you know, just regular bookstores? Like what, and how do you reach those markets? Like, do, is it just all hand sales or do you have? A lot of it, yeah. For me, it's a lot of hand sales. I, I um, a certain, amount, a certain segment of what I do, I do through the Evil Empire. I do it through uh, Amazon KDP, you know? So all the coloring books, one, our, our All Ages Trans series, and several other things are, are available. And what that does, if, you're, if you have books that are available through Amazon KDP, is you also get Ingram distribution. So you, you, know, you, might, you might be publishing something on Amazon and, not, and thinking, well, I have to order author copies to distribute it through this distributor I actually have a, a, a personal relationship with or send them out to my wholesale customers and stores. No, they distribute it directly to like, I'll be on the internet every once and I'll say, I wonder what's new and I'll find out this coloring book of ours that I don't think much about is now available at Barnes and Noble and other stores around the country that I, I, I had no direct involvement in. I get paid for it every month. I get paid for what they call advanced distri expanded distribution from Amazon. So. Um, Amazon's got a lot of problems with it, but you know what? You publish some books with them every month. They put money in your bank account. You don't have to do much. <laughs> once, once they, it's, it is, it is kind of nice. That's, I guess, that's why they are the evil empire. They're very efficient. And, um, and then I think with the other things like, uh, you know, I, I, like the distributors, I, I have mostly handle, um, you know, comic shops. And so a lot of the, like you say, hand sales, like a lot of me showing up with a business card and a stack of books at a, at a, a bookstores. That's like, you know, because. You know, comic shops aren't the only places people buy comics anymore. It's not 1985, you know. And there are a lot more people who go to regular, you know, traditional bookstores, you know, dominated by pros looking for comics, looking for graphic novels or whatever the, whatever the term of art is. And that's, that's where I get my, my hand sales mostly, just, hi, I publish comics and they're the cool thing. You want some? Yeah. So. Cool. Does anyone else have something to contribute on the topic? I was going to say one of the things that's great is that there's a lot of festivals. So I think a lot of comic artists will go to festivals and kind of, I guess it's a different type of hand sale, but you make, you know, you, you meet people that want to have your work and then also you meet people who are tabling alongside you. And I think also like what happens if they own a store in Portland and they want to put your work in it? So I think, again, it's about, um, as you're saying, going to shops and saying, here's my thing. Do you want it? And sometimes they'll say yes. Yeah, so but also in person at tabling events. Yeah, uh, do you guys want to comment briefly, like what is your distribution like? Um, similar approach to what Yasmin is saying, like going to festivals, um, especially prior to um, the pandemic when we were all on lockdown, um, people were really generous about just approaching our table and just being really excited. And we would just sometimes give them a few copies. Um, then we would return home, just print some extra issues and then mail it off to uh, whichever um, comic shop was out of state. But since we live here in the city, we've literally also just done the, the shipping and the handling ourselves, just like driving and making it just like a family event for us to <laughs> just to treat ourselves to some comics too. And um, I don't know if this is like a line to um, the distribution conversation, but we've also have um, some free, I believe some free comics too. Sorry, I'm having brain fog because I got really little sleep. Um, yeah, we have some, I want to say we do have some free comics online because as We've also interacted with um, educators. We also want to make sure the the work is accessible to them because, yeah, as much as people have to like pay high tuition uh, fees to get into these schools, um, we've also been noticing that students can't always afford um, the work. So we try to make that a, another avenue for them to access our work. Yeah, I think part of the uh, being like an indie small press is that you have to wear all the hats. So um, you got to be out there tabling at every comic convention ever in the entire world that doesn't charge you a tabling fee. Um, you, you've got to be out there handing business cards. You got to be throwing events and fundraisers. I mean, you don't got to. This is all stuff that we ended up doing just because we get roped into it a lot. But, um, you know, we have an e-commerce site on our personal website, so we also, like, like, you know, package up all of our own stuff and ship it out. Um, but 
we used to publish through um, like small print on demand services that were local and eventually we found out that there is this thing called Ingram Spark that exists and that took us several several years to find out on our own which brings it back to like ask questions right of other people who are doing it because if we had you know swallowed our ego and just asked other people <laughs> and been like how do you do this we would have found out about it a lot sooner um, but Ingram Spark uh, basically just distributes stuff for you so we had a um we had an incarcerated contributor be like, I had a family member who went to Target and they found the book. And I was like, who the heck is stealing our comics and putting them in Target? And then, you know, come to find out that like they actually distribute to like Target, Barnes and Nobles, all this stuff. And we had no idea. So um, yeah, ask people questions. It's <laughs> a good idea. Um, so we're, we're unfortunately right at time. It's 3.50. If you've got a, a quick question, let's, let's do our best. Sure. Um, looking for um, local printers, independent, that we can support in the Bay Area that would do a traditional graphic novel. Please let us know what you find. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, the, there, there used to be a lot. Now there are not very many. Um, so, and, and we could probably teach a whole master class on distribution and printing and still not even cover all of it because there's just so much out there. But um, please know that we are available and very happy to have those conversations. Um, so um, uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of our panelists for hanging out. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Um, Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here. It is so um, inspiring and humbling that you guys give a shit about what we have to say. Uh, we're going to all be back at our tables for the next two hours of this uh, one, hour. one hour. We have one hour left, so buy all of our comics so that we can keep making them and you can have a nice time with them. Thank you so much. It's a lot to take home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did it? It's done.